So the topic for today, security and privacy challenges in the cloud. The overall goal is to understand what is different in the cloud with respect to security and privacy, about the new risk which didn't exist before the cloud era and how do we overcome them. So for past 15 years, Zoho has been involved in building a suite of cloud SaaS applications for business. Security and privacy are key components in our service offerings and that gets reflected in our people, process and products. We exclusively use Zoho software to run our entire business. Zoho runs entirely on Zoho. Our own customer data, employee data, financial data are stored in Zoho Cloud Services. So in this talk, I will touch upon both the aspects with our experience in building a cloud service and also we are uh, consumers of cloud service. The agenda for this webinar, I'll um, base it on the following topics. How is cloud security perceived currently? Uh, what are the challenges in a cloud native environment? What should be the uh, strategies to be adopted? These will be just generic principles and not about any specific tool. We'll also derive what should be the top points to look for when you choose a cloud uh, service provider. And I'll just end by talking about the security and privacy culture in an organization. So how is cloud security perceived? Let us now talk about the promise of the cloud. So on-premise data centers were far from agile and far from cost-effective to run. Cloud as a technology has reached its maturity uh, stage and we are seeing widespread adoption across industries of various sizes, starting from small startups to Fortune 500 companies. Cloud computing is firmly established as the new normal for enterprise IT. This pandemic has accelerated that adoption. So we all now know cloud is here to stay. What are the top barriers to cloud adoption? So this is a recent survey from 451 Research. So information security concerns are still at the top. 52% of the people still have concerns on cloud security. So if you think, you see a lot of these headlines. There are a lot of breaches resulting from cases like leaving in an S3 bucket open, leaving the failure to protect the management console of a cloud provider. So the company code space, it is a code hosting company, Hosted, or it was hosted on Amazon. They had they lost control of their Amazon management console, and the attacker uh, completely erased the customer data, and they were out of business 12 hours later. The recent one, Capital One, the, it was a huge breach, and it also involved huge fines. So we see this uh, every day in the news, and the breaches, our data breaches, are growing in size, both in the number of organizations that get impacted, and also the number of records that gets leaked. So the question on top of everybody's mind is now, is the cloud secure? So uh, I would uh, bring up aspect of possibly this is not the right person to ask. There is also a, a advantage, a security advantage when you move to cloud. It provides better security as the cloud providers are going to invest a lot in terms of resources and technologies when compared to what any enterprise does um, for their on-premise infrastructure. The top cloud providers will be quick to fix the vulnerabilities to keep your data protected. They have a better resiliency. Uh, if you take the uh, provider's uptime SLAs, it is going to compare well with your own data center. So how should we see this? It is not about cloud is less secure or more secure. Cloud is differently secure. And how would security be different in the cloud? What are the challenges, best practices? And how do we translate those best practices to technical controls. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Let us now look first to the cloud native challenges. So organizations are at different stages of cloud adoption. So some organizations go with the cloud first approach uh, for the new projects, but the legacy systems can uh, still remain on-premise. So they have a hybrid cloud environment. Depending upon the business need, organizations also choose the various uh, models, like uh, you are using infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or software as a service. What do I mean by cloud native? Sometimes certain organizations, they do a lift and shift approach. You migrate your whole Java application into EC2 instance. This is just not cloud native. So you, you are not embracing cloud native principle just by running on AWS. So let us um, try to understand the difference between the traditional model and the cloud native world. Traditional model had a network perimeter boundary around your corporate data center, whereas in cloud, this has disappeared. Your cloud environment is dynamic. The auto scaling is going to spawn new instances, containers, or need bases. You have serverless functions like Lambda, which are very uh, short-lived and ephemeral. 
and we moved from a monolithic application to a microservice-based architecture. And cloud specifically is multi-tenant. That is the main funder. So resources are shared among your customers. And in cloud native world, we have faster deployments. So uh, earlier we had release cycle once in month or week. We have moved to a model where there are multiple production pushes per day. The, there are automated pipelines which remove the manual steps involved in shipping code from commit to production. So we have thought about the differences and we can see that there are going to be both strengths and challenges in the cloud native world. Strength in terms of faster deployment, better architecture, and a lot of challenges. For the challenges, let me categorize them into three buckets, security challenges, data production challenges, and trust. So security challenges will mostly involve around the change in the architecture concept. Your perimeter-based security earlier based on firewalls uh, and intrusion direction and prevention systems at the perimeter, which will not be relevant, much relevant now. And there are a lot of new architecture components, which is going to pro, uh, have an expanded attack surface. How do I maintain an accurate CMDB inventory in such a dynamic environment? And in traditional environment, we have periodic scanning. How will this, what is the context of that vulnerability scanning in an ephemeral short-lived resource? Next, lack of visibility. Uh, do organizations have visibility on the cloud resource usage? This is the problem of uh, shadow IT. So uh, if you think uh, it is now very easy for a developer to spin an Amazon instance, or even for your business people to sign up for a um, software as a service and push your CRM data or something like that. So does the organization have visibility on the cloud usage? And uh, inside when uh, what logging and monitoring data will uh, the organization be able to get from the cloud provider systems? In case of incidents, what evidences can be got from the cloud systems? Next is security was the speed. Gentle tendency in any organization is to look at security as a roadblock to business. So in a cloud uh, world, security also needs to scale to adopt to the faster change cycles. Coming to the data protection challenges, so we know cloud is a multi-tenant environment. If you're using infrastructure as a service or platform as a service, we're going to be sharing the same physical host via virtualization or container technologies. If you're using SaaS, your data is going to reside in the same physical database as other customers with logical separation controls. So data isolation is going to be very critical in the cloud world to make sure one customer data is not leaked to other customers. And in your traditional model, you had some control and visibility on where your data is. In cloud, there is a lot of data movement. Uh, it is actually a myth to think that the data the organization puts in a cloud SaaS service is just going to reside in the cloud database or file system. So it, is, it will be there in the database file system. It gets logged. It is present in the search engine systems. It gets into big data pipelines, into ML models. And guess what? It can even flow from one cloud provider to another through integrations. How do we have traceability on the data to make sure appropriate security and privacy controls are applied in all places? Next, the data residency. But various regulations introduced uh, by different countries data residency becomes an important thing. Where is my data stored geographically? Will the backup copy be also be in the same geographical location? These are going to be concerns for every cloud customer. Data portability. Will I be able to get a copy of my data back on closing my account if I want to move to another cloud provider? What happens if the cloud provider goes out of business? Will I be able to get my data back? Data retention and sanitization. So will the cloud provider completely erase all copies of data on request? So there have been cases where uh, uh, we sign up for a cloud service, and then I close the account, and I believe all my data is deleted. The cloud service has a breach um, years later, and we still find that our data gets leaked. So data deletion becomes very important. The trust. So you can look at cloud as another outsourcing component. So as with any outsourcing provider, there needs to be clear accountability and liability terms defined. Who's responsible for what? And will the cloud provider have access to the customer data? And will the cloud provider be transparent on the purpose of data processing? So if you take now 
the cloud stores data from a lot of clients and the provider can run some data mining algorithms to get a large um, amount of information and such profile data can be put to misuse either directly by the cloud provider or you can uh, sold to any other third party firm so the cloud, do we have the trust from the cloud provider the supply chain can be a weakest link in a security posture and it doesn't just end with the cloud provider it is also the third parties engaged by the cloud provider they became a part they become a part of your supply chain Regulatory compliance. If your organization needs to be compliant with regulations like PCI, HIPAA, and you transfer such sensitive data to the cloud, it also becomes imperative to verify the compliance posture of the cloud provider. So we have talked in length about the challenges we faced in a cloud native world. Let us talk about the strategies to adopt to overcome these challenges. So these are some basic four principles I will talk about, which can address these challenges. Adopt zero trust, build security in every layer, design in security feedback loops, and understand and adopt the shared responsibility model. First, adopt zero trust. This is known with the slogan, never trust, always verify. So the traditional security model, which is the castle and moat security model, it is based often on one large perimeter which secures the internal network with firewalls and all workloads internally are considered to be in a trusted environment. We trust everybody inside the network and people outside are not trusted. This model also didn't take into account any insider threat or any compromised user identity. Say an employee of yours um, uh, credentials are leaked. So once some attacker is inside your internal network, it is difficult to contain the lateral movement because everything is trusted inside that network. And with cloud world, we have this perimeter which is vanished. The enterprise users are out of the perimeter. They are accessing data from any location, from many devices. And the data is also now out of the traditional perimeter as the workload shift to public cloud. So we bring upon this zero trust model. This is a response to the breakdown in the traditional perimeter-based security model. This is not something new. It has uh, been around a concept for as long as 20 years. Jericho Forum in UK, he talked about deperimetrization. Treat everything as if it is exposed to the open internet and then apply your security controls. 2013, Google started implementing this internally and they called it Beyond Corp. So different words, similar ideas. The word zero trust has stuck. A uh, few people don't like this term. It seems to indicate that uh, you don't trust your employees. But this is not how you look at zero trust. It is more about how we have the controls closer to the endpoint on the workload. So in zero trust, you don't trust something just because it is inside the firewall. And emphasize more on the identity as the new perimeter. So the traditional model had a static nature of trust, on, off, allow, or deny. You will verify some username, password, and then allow. In zero trust, we go to a model of dynamic uh, trust. So multiple layers of trust are verified frequently and constantly. Every user, every device, every session must be authenticated and authorized. A dynamic trust score is calculated from multiple data points, and even that trust score is ephemeral. It is going to be valid only for that particular session. And zero trust also emphasizes micro segmentation. You, um, divide your perimeters into small zones so that you can shrink your attack surface. So we saw that the identity is going to be the main emphasis on zero trust. To take the goal of any identity and access management, the right people have the right access to the right resources at the right time. And now I'm going to introduce two more things. And this access is going to be assessed continuously. And we have to also make sure that the access is, access is provided with the least possible use of friction. To think about the evolution of these identity management systems. So we had the era back where there was fragmented identity. There will be an on-premise AD to manage user accounts. Different business applications will have their own authentication and authorization um, systems. Users have to remember different passwords. Then we moved on to having a unified IAM, single sign-on. Bring in some uh, basic two-factor authentication role-based access controls. The next stage was enhanced multi-factor authentication like TOTP, biometrics, 
And there were also some context level check. Say a user is logging in from an unknown location. I, as a user, will always log in from Chennai. Now the system sees me logging in from US. Or I'm logging in from a new device. So it is always Chrome browser, Mac laptop. Now uh, the system sees a new Windows laptop with a IE browser. These contextual checks are validated and the users are alerted. Next, we are now moving into, with Zero Trust, we are moving into a risk-based adaptive IAM. So what do I mean by this adaptive IAM? So unlike the traditional access control of allow and deny, adaptive access control works and adjusts the access based on risk factors. And this risk uh, trust score is derived from user, device, location. So let us take some examples. If your user uh, in your organization is downloading a very sensitive document from your word drive on your man unmanaged device from your home network, possibly this is where you need to step up the authentication and ask for extra verification or possibly even completely deny it based on your organization policy. On the other hand, if the same user is going to be just accessing the lunch cafeteria menu, the level of identity verification can be lenient. So the, the identity verification can be proportionally based on the type of data access. State the design of such ident adaptive IAM system, the resource owner, that is a cloud um, data source, can define the risk tolerance and say, I need this level of assurance, I need this level of trust score to grant access. And the zero trust authentication system is going to gather various data points from the various signals mentioned here, calculate the trust score, and take the decision to either grant access or block. I'll just touch upon the various uh, signals we can involve. So the user, you can have the normal authentication and authorization factors. You can use behavior analytics to and step up authentication in case of any anomaly. Say an employee who has never logged in at a particular time of a day uh, at early morning, 3 a.m., and he's also accessing a sensitive data, possibly will ask for an um, additional verification. The device factor is important. So in normal cases, uh, organization, um, they want to have their sensitive data access from a corporate-owned managed device. But if you take in the current uh, remote working scenarios, there have been organizations who have not been able to even provide company-owned devices to its employees. I think we are seeing the bring your own device wave is here to say, stay. So what can be done is to Check the security posture of the endpoint, even if it is not a corporate device. Does the endpoint have up-to-date patches? Is this encryption enabled in the endpoint? So is my antivirus on? What is the EDR status in that endpoint? We can't control users on what device they are using, but you can enforce policies on the security state of the device if sensitive data is going to be accessed. We'll also bind the user to the device using certificate authentication. So it is not that any user can use any corporate device. They have to use the assigned device. Now, other signals are mostly uh, familiar to us. The location, if it is from a new geographical location, and also is it a case of impossible travel? Say, I as a user logged in from uh, to the system at 10 o'clock from Chennai, and again, I see a login at 12 o'clock from US, which is a clear anomaly. In network signals, is it is the access from a new IP? Is it uh, coming via any TOR or anonymized VPN? Is it connection from a public unsecured Wi-Fi? And the most important thing is your application of the data, where you control what is the sensitivity of the data that is accessed. Is it as a public resource? It is a shared resource or a very sensitive private resource? And also, we can have the privileged access defined here. So the sysadmins in your company, they are going to be the administrators for that application. If they are accessing uh, and trying to do some sensitive access, like adding a new uh, another admin user, you need to have the highest possible trust score and make sure all this is satisfied before they are granted access to do that. Next so, part, yeah. I just want to ask a question. So how do you exactly uh, balance between ensuring that the level of security you put in is not too prohibitive. Where do you have that balance? OK. So uh, the zero trust also, as I told, it uh, the one of the principles is to make sure we provide this user access with the least friction possible. So uh, I think my, my next slide also talks about specifically about that. I wanted to touch upon this multi-factor authentication. Oh, so, right. yeah, yeah. so 
passwords are in nf anymore the mfa technology has been there for a long time the difference now is you should do it for everybody not just your privileged administrators but we need more factors more flexibility user experience needs to be weighed in we should leverage consumerized multi factor rely more on form factor mobile as a form factor for authentication so that you can avoid uh, introducing extra friction on the other hand we also have these uh, um fission resistant mfa solution a physical security key which you can carry and there is a new standard we both coming in which most of the browsers now support which paves way for passwordless authentication you use just mobile as a form factor there will be a local uh, communication between your browser and the registered mobile device and you tap a push notification you are going to get signed on in your uh, application in the desktop so yes to uh, having a very user friendly authentication mechanism is also uh, very important so have least friction for the user as well so that is also one of the principles of the zero trust and deepa uh, is it not possible that one invests far too much on the security infrastructure and and makes it very robust but how do businesses draw a balance between the effort put on security and the return of investment uh, so uh, security is always seen as a trust center there is no profit for the security team right so, well, I didn't say that. I'm just asking you. <laughs> no, that is, uh, yeah. that is the truth. I didn't, okay. that. Yeah. I didn't say that. I just wanted to know because you have been adding this. So, how, how does one actually draw a line? How does one balance between a business imperative and a security imperative? So, you can look at it in two aspects. One is the budget, but most of the cases, your higher budget doesn't result in higher security. That is the truth. Actually, uh, we can see a lot of nimble startups. Uh, which are very lean enough so they don't have this legacy systems they are able to even move forward in uh, adopting such new zero trust models very easily when compared to a bigger organization so uh, budget itself is not the main concern here and also uh, one more thing was uh, security should also act as a business enabler we can't be the team which says no for everything <laughs> that is not going to work out so how right. do we so at, at that that note i'll just ask a question because i think it's very pertinent uh, it was asked by uh, sita lakshmi saying is mfa treated as the highest level of authentication or is there anything with higher level of precision possible uh, so mfa is again a various uh, we are uh, arriving at a lot of technologies in mfa so it just started with sms based authentication now sms based uh, second factor is seen as very weak so then it evolved into uh, totp biometric and possibly i see this passwordless authentication is a perfect balance between where you get more security and it also is also more usable so we have this physical security key but again the organization has to invest on uh, such security keys now this passwordless authentication can be the uh, fitting answer to that so uh, mfa surely is now mainstream it provides a better authentication uh, mechanism all right thank you please proceed okay so uh, this is about the zero trust model so if you are a cloud consumer you should be looking at ways on how you can adopt this principle to have secure access to your cloud environment and if you are a cloud provider also you should look at how you can have this adaptive iam support in your applications so zoho is one of the companies we provide all these mfa uh, models and also as an organization we are trying to adopt the zero trust across the company the next topic i'm going to talk about is uh, building security in each layer so there are various layers in cloud so infrastructure platform application the end clients which is going to access when we talk about multi security layer it is about security getting embedded in each of the layers it is the typical difference in depth approach which is very commonly uh, spoken about in security each layer must be self defending it should have security integrated and applied so such embedded security measures will provide you more contextual defense and threat uh, detection say take for example uh, instead of having a web application firewall layer as a separate one you embed that web application firewall agent inside your application that is going to uh, give you more visibility because it understands more the context of the application now there are various controls that can be applied in each of these layer so most of these are similar technologies that are adopted in the on premise environment 
depending on the layer now in the cloud some of these has to be applied in house some others in the cloud provider environment so as a cloud consumer you need to make sure you understand the controls and these are enabled in your cloud instance so possibly let us say at the infrastructure layer most of the cloud providers like amazon google they provide something called as a secure boot vm so even in case of an advanced persistent attack the bootloader will uh, determine there is a defect and uh, prevent uh, booting the systems at the platform layer so as i said cloud is very dynamic uh, you should have security configuration parameters embedded in your vm or container definitions so once you um, create a container image make sure you have proper um, intrusion detection agents bundled that's part of the container image or scan the container image as a part of your deployment process so i am going to now concentrate more about the uh, data layer the top one so data drives all that we do so data has its own life journey understanding the data journey when it comes to cloud is going to be pretty challenging we need to protect the data wherever it lives travels and breathes if you look at the various stages in the data life cycle so data first gets created it gets stored in various formats it is shared with different entities archived and then destroyed this is your typical data uh, life cycle you need to make sure the security and privacy principles are adopted in all of these stages confidentiality is to ensure that there is no unauthorized access to your data say a payroll software nobody else should be able to um, access my pay slip integrity is to ensure that data is not tampered with you, anybody else cannot modify my salary details availability to make sure the user has reliable access to the data and on top of this we have the privacy which talks about minimal data collection if it is a crm system what is the purpose of collecting that information and do you process it only for that purpose limited retention and consent so if you take the data in any organization you find the structured data like your crm data erp data to be 20% and the rest of it is mostly unstructured data like your email file documents and drive images video files so this provides a lot of uh, complexity the unstructured data so let us take an example of a uh, support help desk software the main entities are ticket and uh, attachments but when this is going to be used by a healthcare organization we are going to have phi data in the ticket and attachments so it becomes very imperative to classify the pii phi and also to identify all the data sources where it is being stored so in zoho we have this uh, thing called as we define it as an activity register as a part of the business process you describe where the data flows and what are the data processing activities that is carried out say a lead information is collected by a web form it is populated in zoho crm it gets synced with campaigns it gets pushed to analytics for reporting this is going to provide the overall visibility of the data flow and data needs to be tagged depending on the sensitivity so in context of our Go zoho services it allows customer to tag fields as a particular data type and we can extend this something like there can be an ml based auto classification of data so which can automatically scan your mail or word drive attachments to automatically identify if it contains pii or phi data so this is a futuristic uh, approach so data classification is first very important to know what data we have and then apply the relevant controls so next it goes to the storage layer data encryption is the basic control there data exists in three states at rest and transit and in use data in transit means information travels in a network uh, you're sending an email you're communicating via chat you're uploading or downloading files when it is at rest it is stored in a digital form in a physical device like a hard disk or usb drive data in use is information which is actively being processed accessed or loaded into the dynamic memory of the um, application server or the databases so data must be protected in all three of these stages and also during transition from one state to another so most of the cloud providers we have this data encryption and transit like when the data flows over the public network or between data centers it is encrypted to make sure there is no man in the middle attack data encryption at rest again can be done in various layers at the hardware level at the database level application layer so if you talk about at the hardware level full disk encryption that is going to protect you when your computer or cell phone is stolen and somebody tries to access the content physically you do encryption at the database layer 
uh, it is going to protect you against the, when the adversary has access to the data in DB machine, but not the 3B credentials. But application layer encryption provides you more security when the app layer encrypts the data before it is pushed to the database systems. And uh, de-identification is also one of the main concepts which can you So you have some personal data which is going to um, get pushed to the analytics systems for some reporting. Possibly at the analytics system, the exact PII uh, uh, information is not needed. So you apply some tokenization or masking mechanisms to make sure the PII is not revealed to the analytics system. In cloud Deepa, scenario... Just to, uh, just yeah. to interrupt, Deepa, how do you define PII and PHI, please? Okay, so PII is any personally identifiable information, so which can directly relate to an individual. So your name, your email address, and there are more sensitive PIIs like, um, say, you, your ethnic origin, your um, gender, your age, all this combines the PII. And when health information is collected, so my name and my blood test report or my X-ray scan report, it becomes the PHI. Thank you. And um, so uh, in cloud scenarios, the key management is uh, very important. So in your on-premise, possibly you had control of the key. Key is the one which is going to encrypt your data and you again decrypt it using the key. So uh, that is the main critical part in encryption. So if you're going for a cloud provider, normally the cloud provider is going to generate a key for every customer. But if you feel you need more security, there are even providers which allow you to bring your own key. Similar to bring your own device mechanisms, we have bring your own key. But you can have your own key management system, generate your keys, and then integrate with your cloud application so that it will just fetch the key when it is needed, decrypt it. So only for that particular time, the key is going to be there in the memory. So these are some higher security mechanisms. And I'll just touch upon a few futuristic technologies which, with respect to uh, encryption. So I talked about three states, in, at rest, in transit, when in use. So this confidential computing is about encryption of data when in use. So what is it we are trying to protect here? So when the application is loading your data in the memory for processing, it is going to be there in the plain text state. Can we apply more security controls? Say, even if the application is exploited, certain sensitive data will not be uh, available to the adversary. For this, we have something called as a secure enclave at the chip level, Intel as well, the SGX uh, chips. So any sensitive data processing can be offloaded to these chips so that even any adversary having access to the machines or access to a vulnerable uh, exploited application cannot read the plain text data. And this is about confidential. Just to, just to uh, re-clarify. So let us say we have uh, a bunch of data in the system. Let us say it is about uh, the salaries of the employees, and uh, the company has to file tax for whatever revenue is generated. So when the calculations is are being done in terms of the total revenue accrued, and yeah. then salary disbursed, and then finally arrive at the the net profit. So this mm -hmm. calculation, which is happening in memory, is right. this encrypted or is it uh, uh, vulnerable to attack? Yeah, that is what is when in use means. So, pause. yeah, it is going to be in the data state. So, at rest means in your database systems, in your file systems, it is encrypted. But once the application tries to fetch it from the database systems and do a computation, it is going to be there in the decrypted state. And if you are handling very sensitive information, possibly you can look at such confidential computing, uh, which allows you to offload the secure processing to a special enclave. So that yeah. even a person having a uh, application memory access cannot read the plain text. And uh, leading towards towards next question in this regard is again from Sita Lakshmi. The question is: uh, Can the encryption logic or algorithm be defined by an end user or a customer? And if you, if so, how can it be integrated uh, to, in order to make it encrypted when accessing one's own data? Uh, in security world, we say this, don't roll your own crypto algorithms. That is a big no, okay? So we have standard mechanisms like the AES, two tests algorithms, uh, all these defined. So uh, trying to roll your own um, um, encryption algorithm is not uh, really advisable. So encryption, the critical component is going to be the key. So 
if anybody has access to the key they can decrypt it so we don't have many attacks on the um, so there have been attacks like aes um, uh, before aes we had triple des algorithms which were then proved to be weak and then the community came up with aes so but i feel that the goal should not be we write our own encryption algorithm so the customers possibly can look at should the cloud provider own the key or should i own the key that is where i talked about bring your own key so possibly the key ownership should lie with the customer and they just provide just in time access for the key so that they can retain the ownership of the key they need not even rely on the cloud provider they need not have the doubt whether the cloud provider can read the unencrypted data because without the key even their cloud provider employee cannot read it so we should look at trying to have the key management ownership with the customer but not about uh, rolling out your own encryption algorithm right thank you Please proceed. Yeah. So this is about confidential computing. The other aspect is again computing on encrypted data. So the other uh, Shantar had uh, mentioned about. So we are decrypting data to do some computations or searching also. So the basic one uh, thing that has happened is what we called as equality preserving encryption, deterministic encryption, possibly where you can search and say if the two encrypted strings are same. So I have encrypted uh, the name. If I want to again search where name equal to Deepa, possibly I can do a search with the encrypted string itself. But any other computations, there are algorithms evolving called as homomorphic algorithms where the computation itself can be done on the encrypted data. So next I come to the share part. So collaboration has been a game changer in terms of productivity, specifically during these remote work scenarios. But at the same time, we should have uh, collaboration or sharing controls to be accurately defined depending upon the type of data involved. So if you take in SaaS world, uh, our vendors need to have features to say if a particular data is uh, tagged as sensitive, don't allow uh, any user to publish it externally without any password or even um, uh, disallow publishing outside your organization. And it is uh, just not about the data which you share uh, in an integrated world, cloud talks with other cloud. So third-party integrations and app extensions are other means by which data is shared. User sharing a data to another user is one aspect, but you also have another other extensions, integrations through which data goes to another third-party vendor. So we need to make sure the scope of such integrations, the type of the data that gets shared are all considered before enabling a integration. Then uh, as an extension of this uh, uh, collaboration restriction, we can also have information right management. This is something like you allow access to the uh, another user, but will uh, disable printing or uh, downloading of a file so that you uh, make sure the data leak doesn't carry over. So somebody downloads to their own laptop and that laptop is not encrypted and it gets lost, the data scroll goes on. So those uh, concepts can be adopted. And we have something like uh, defined as data loss prevention policies. You can have rules like uh, in your email system, if your email content or your attachment contains these words, uh, your OCR systems can scan the attachment and find out the words. And you don't even allow email sending uh, outside your organization boundary if there is a very sensitive information. So next, I will uh, go with uh, data retention and deletion. This is about how long does the information transfer to the cloud retained? So it is necessary that they have to uh, have defined retention policies. And uh, there have been cases of breaches which involve tons of data of accounts that were closed long before. Cloud providers should have defined retention uh, policies. And when we um, talk about retention, there should also be the case of there is a litigation hold. If your company is involved in a legal case and you need to preserve data which is there in the cloud, the vendors should provide support for that. Any data related to your organization should be maintained along with modifications and deletions. And then finally comes scalable, reliable, and demonstrable data deletion by the vendors. So in uh, the GDPR privacy stance, it is the right to be forgotten clause, whereby the end user can instruct to delete all traces of data related to him. Then it is upon the vendor to make sure it is deleted across the data stores reliably and also we should provide proof for such deletions so data sovereignty is a concept that data is subject to countries laws where it is stored within the border so more cloud providers they handle it by having data centers around the globe even in zoho we have this multiple uh, data centers so 
So as a customer, you should make sure you sign to the appropriate data center locations. But in some cases, uh, you have to also make sure your backup is also within the same geography. And another aspect is, so we call this as a cross-border data transfer. Is there, even if you sign up to a particular data center, is there any uh, cross-border uh, data transfer happening? Because uh, you can think about, even if your data is going to be located in your India data center, is there any integration, say you or the cloud provider integrates with the third-party SMS vendor, which is now going to be hosted in US. So obviously, there will be a cross-border data transfer. The solution to this is we support different regional sub-processes. So within India itself, we have an integration vendor. So data ownership and transparency. So this is uh, to give clarity on the data is always owned by the customer and not by the cloud provider. The ownership of the data lies with the customer. And in uh, some cases, possibly the cloud provider will have access to the data. Say if a support technician needs to troubleshoot uh, some issue reported by you. So how do we do this? So in Zoho, we have this concept of the customer has to go and enable the access and say share this data with the support technician. Even in such cases, all the access is recorded and it is auditable by the customer. So we don't have any uh, user tracking mechanisms. And there's also a transparency on what are all the third party vendors that we uh, integrate with. So this is about the whole data protection lifecycle. So I will jump on to the next one, the security feedback loops. Know the normal, then you can find the evil. In an intrusion case, finding the difference between normal and evil is often the difference between success and failure in trying to uh, stop the attack. A lot of effort we put in securing the resources in the cloud. But while we are building the controls itself, we must also plan for alerting and notification capabilities so that, uh, that uh, we'll be in loop on any uh, abnormal event and take appropriate actions. So I will take this as a three-step approach, collect, analyze, and respond. The first step is to enable telemetry at all layers of the cloud architecture. So what should be the telemetry signals we should be interested in? By identity activity, I mean some addition of accounts. Is there a privileged account getting added? Is there unusual login locations? Is there a spike in failed logins for a particular user? Is there a lot of failed logins coming from a particular geolocation? So we see credentials getting leaked in public. So there are cases where people take out these credentials and then try to brute force it against your own account. This is called as password spray or credential stuff in attack. We should be able to detect all these with these identity activities, telemetry. Next, so data activity means uh, do you see an unusual amount of file downloads? Is there an unusual amount of uh, data changes? Say your finance system, there, there will be mostly no updates and possibly very rare. But if you see an uh, um, unusual amount of data changes happening, that can be an anomaly. So is there a specific grant like mailbox forwarding or delegation which has happened for a lot of number of users? In resource activity, it is about detecting brute force at the system level. Is there an unusual process in the resource instance? And at the top network activity, is there any traffic connection to the bad domains? Is there an abnormal data transfer which can indicate data exfiltration? So once we define what is the goal of what, what do we need to monitor, then comes the data sources. So depending upon the cloud services you use, say infrastructure SaaS or PaaS, the cloud provider will have native solutions to collect relevant logs or events. It can range from basic access logs to full-blown audit logs, to configuration logs. In SaaS case, you can have the full audit trail. You can even uh, have cases of your, uh, the web application firewall uh, logs describing the intrusion attempts specific to a particular customer. Then we have the analyze stage, which involves applying uh, basic rules, starts with just uh, basic rules, and then you can have uh, user and entity behavior analytics and go on with advanced ML to identify anomalies. So in multi-cloud environment also, having this, what we call as a situational awareness is important. So instead of focusing on individual alerts, have a whole grasp on the whole situation, say, and then correlate the events. Say there is a password, password spray attack detection, then there is also unusual file download. There's a huge spike in traffic outbound. You need to correlate all this to identify the impact. And the response stage is about how you respond to a security incident. 
uh, lack of control can be a concern when you are investigating an incident in cloud. So as a consumer, possibly you don't own the systems, you don't own the network, and in some cases, you don't even own the um, applications. The immediate response can be um, first revert the accounts, reset passwords. If you find any malicious third party uh, apps, you revoke access. And if there is a data corruption, you need to work with the cloud provider to possibly recover from a known backup. There are breach notification obligations. So you need to have a contractual clarity with the cloud provider to say the cloud provider will notify you within this particular timeline so that you can again notify your customers or any legal uh, authorities. So this is what I have with respect to implementing feedback loops. The last topic which I covered is about the shared responsibility, which is very important to understand in the cloud world. So the cloud provider will be res responsible for security of the cloud, and the cloud customer is responsible for security in the cloud. So again, let us just go back and see how this is going to be different upon what type of cloud you use. So in on premise, you see, the total stack is under the control of the customer. If you move to the infrastructure as a service, then um, till the host virtualization is with the cloud provider. But from the OS, it is going to be the cloud customer's responsibility. So if there is a vulnerable patch, uh, which we need to do at the OS level, the customer is responsible for patching. But a lot of cloud providers make it easy for you to upgrade, uh, provide you proper alerts, everything. And you move up the stack to platform as a service, Till the middleware, it is the cloud provider's responsibility from the application, the customer's responsibility. So even in the SaaS layer, though we say the till the application, or the, it is going to be the cloud provider, the important aspect of identity and access management, what data you put in, who has access is all under the responsibility of a cloud customer. So I just want to take two cases where we can talk about these uh, uh, shared responsibility in a, a clear way. So for Zoom, um, use has skyrocketed during this pandemic time. In the early stages, there was something called as a Zoom bombing. So these are just with some examples. This has happened with a lot of vendors. So if you take this case, possibly we can say that uh, the end user of the Zoom uh, were to blame because they had put the shared the meeting link with the in social media. They didn't uh, create a password meeting. But then Zoom also took steps to curb this, make password as mandatory have waiting rooms as default so that uh, you make it easier for the user to adopt the security controls. And even in the case of Capital One breach, so Capital One was at fault for possibly misconfiguring the AWS firewall rule in a public facing server. But even Amazon was, in a, the Capital One hosted on Amazon, So, what, but Amazon was summoned for legal uh, scrutiny on why they didn't provide their metadata service layer, which is uh, which caused the problem? Why couldn't it be more secure? So, and Amazon uh, took some steps to even uh, strengthen it after this incident. So, as a cloud provider, you need to be building services with embedded data protection controls. So, make it by default. You have to protect the data in service operations, and you try to empower your customers to protect the data. As a cloud customer. You must understand and enable the data protection features, have a responsibility matrix defined clearly on who is responsible for what, who, what are you responsible for, what are the cloud provider responsible for, and also strengthen it with contracts. So this is our shared responsibility model, which we have in our website, which where we go deep about each of these cases and uh, try to clearly give the customer an idea of who is responsible for what. So these are about the strategies to adopt. So this is what I wanted to talk as basic principles uh, trying to overcome the challenges in cloud. So with all this, let us look the main points on what will you have to look for in a cloud vendor. Make sure they have a multi-layered security model, security and privacy enabling features and controls, whether the provider is very transparent on their commitments for security and privacy, uptime commitments, we have uh, all 99.99%. See if they are uh, providing uh, data for that uh, for that so how much time has it actually been reached and do you have a contractual agreement on all these commitments and if you're in a regulatory industry then possibly you need to choose a cloud provider vendor who also has some third party certifications for that so these are some basic certifications which uh, most of the cloud providers adhere to so the 27001 and 27017 specific to cloud security 27018 specific to 
cloud privacy. So that is it about general cloud stuff. So I'll just end by talking about uh, just building the culture of security and privacy in your organization. So there's nothing specific to cloud, but how do you have this security and privacy aware culture? So we all know now security or privacy is going to need to be everybody's responsibility. It is not an era where uh, your IT team or your security team is responsible and uh, they'll take care of everything. So I think now everybody understands that it is everybody's uh, responsibility. How do we now decentralize and make uh, everybody responsible? Possibly groom security and privacy champions in each of your team, the business units. They can spare out the efforts within their boundary. And create a culture where good security and privacy is valued. So in most of the cases in security world, uh, we call it as the hall of shame. If somebody does something bad, you're in the hall of shame. Possibly we should look at having a hall of fame where uh, any team or any individual who adopts a good security and privacy practice is motivated enough. And focus on real risk and risk reduction. So uh, this, you can never bring the risk possibly to 0%. What are the appropriate controls you have? How, what impact can the risk create? Do you slow down the attacker? So those are the things we should be, uh, we should be providing actionable at uh, worth items, possibly the business teams and development teams on how they can reduce the risk. Design systems with privacy and security as the foundational requirement. So this is about uh, having uh, security privacy requirements in the early stages of development cycle. We have this DevSecOps coming up. So during each cycle of the uh, building, coding, development, we have appropriate security toolings embedded so that you can't, you can't say like you complete the product and then we'll do a security assessment and say what is all wrong, go back to the drawing board. So that cannot be the way to go forward. As a security uh, and privacy team, we need to be agile, flexible, and collaborate with other business unit, you can't work in silo. And with your customer, you have to be transparent on the security commitments, privacy commitments on the data privacy right. So possibly the takeaways, the cloud journey is not a sprint. So it's not like something I do today and I forget about it, it is a marathon. Adopt zero trust, build a strong identity foundation, have a layered security approach, Understand about the sh uh, shared responsibility and always try to build a strong culture of security and privacy in your organization. So yeah, with that, 